Great. Um, so my name is Matthew Hungerford. I'm a firmware engineer for Pebble. Um, I've been working on core graphics for the last couple months for S4. So some of the text flow, um, some of the low-level drawing libraries that we've, we've been doing. Um, so our agenda for the next 45 minutes or so is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the past fonts, PNG images, um, PDC and SVG on Pebble, um, using APNG for animations, like kind of GIF style animations. Um, we're going to get more advanced towards the end and talk about frame buffer effects, um, something new that we're presenting that has been possible for a while, but it's been rather hard until recently, is uh, off-screen rendering. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit, bit about animations versus power. Um, so first off, you know, it was amazing we, when we came up with Pebble. We gave everyone a one-bit um, wearable, and people made all these amazing apps. And uh, so it always um, just blows my mind that you, the developer community, has taken that, you know, two colors essentially just on or off and made um, some astounding apps. And uh, I, th I think of like where we were last year at the developer retreat, and we were talking about dithering so you can get one more shade of color, a, a gray. Or we were talking about uh, just being able to compress images so you could fit a couple more in the firmware. And now we've got you know, lots of colors, microphone, all these new features. It's so exciting where we're at. But it's so amazing where we've come from. And this is all thanks to you guys making amazing apps. Um, so first off, we're going to start kind of easy, something that everyone recognizes. We're going to start with fonts. I mean, pretty much everyone who's made an app here has used fonts on Pebble. Um, one of the interesting things with um, doing fonts in color now is we have a lot more concerns about contrast. It used to be your background was black or white, and your font was the opposite. Now the issue is that you might have a blue background or a mixed color background, and you have to worry about keeping that font legible on top of that. Um, so here we have an example where I've got the Pebble color palette, and I just want to center the time on it. Well, because I have every color represented, I want to make sure that I have some way that I can contrast that font against it. Um, so this is a technique called bilayer fonts. Um, the Pebble APIs right now only allow you to use one color per font per layer. Um, so the trick here is that you create two layers, essentially. You render the same text twice, once for the background for the outline, once for the foreground for the for foreground color. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about how you make these outlines. Um, very few tools can generate them. Um, I've seen a couple of people do it in Python, where you can script it up with uh, the free type engine. Um, and basically, we render uh, both of those layers to get that bordered font. And so here's a, a fun little watch face I have with a moving background, which, um, because you never know what might be coming by, you want to make sure you don't obstruct your text and, and time. Um, so first off, I'm going to start with a new font that's kind of fun. It's a hack font. It's an open source font. So if you want, you can um, grab it, take a look at it. Um, we're going to use the next example. Um, the tool we're going to be using for this is called FontForge. Um, it's probably the best open source font editing tool. It's also probably the worst UI of any tool ever. <laughs> um, and they've got it for uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux. It takes a little while to set up, so let's not do that here. Um, I'd say I, I think a Mac it takes maybe half an hour to set up. Um, so if you were to open that font, the hack font, this is what you'd see on FontForge. Um, you can scroll down. It's a full Unicode font. Um, f for the concerns of Pebble, we, we only really care about you know, 0 through 9, and then all the Latin fonts up here. So just the section, not the thousands that are down here. So for some of the processing we're going to do next, if you don't select the characters you're interested in, you'll take minutes rather than seconds, because you're going to go through every character. So here we've got them all selected. We basically just drag and drop the mouse across them to highlight, select them. We're going to go up to Elements and say Expand Stroke. There's a couple different ways to make a good bordered font. This is the fastest way, and it ends up being pretty good. There's a much slower way of actually using um, uh, transformations create outli outline, but that takes a lot more uh, time because you can't separate the foreground and background fonts in FontForge without doing it manually. So that means you have to go over every character yourself. Um, this will just make a nice little background font. So that's what we get out of it. So we've expanded the strokes. And the values that we would have used there would have been 250 for the stroke width, 250 for the height. And uh, you could change the pen type. It really depends on what your font is. If it's a more flowy font, you might want the circular. If it's a more boxy font, like I've got, 
you might want the uh, rectangular. And that's the outline it creates. So now we're going to export that as another TTF. So we have the original font that we downloaded, the hack.ttf. We're going to take this um, new backgrounded font. It's a bigger, bolder one. Um, we didn't change any of the font metrics. So we haven't changed the kerning tables. We haven't changed the font character widths or the heights. We've only changed the actual character size of themselves. So when we render them, they'll render in the exact same spot, independent of how big the characters actually have become. So at the end, we do file, generate font, save as a TTF, as hack outline. In code, we're going to have two text layers. Um, you could do graphics draw text also. Um, we're going to create one for the outline, one for the text. We have to configure both of them with the same value. So I've just hard coded them here so you can see, you know, here's the 30 height. There's the positions we'd use. Um, in one font, we're doing the uh, colors black. In the other font, we're doing the colors white. So that's the background, this is the foreground. Uh, we've set the background to both of them for clear because we don't actually want that white box behind our text. We actually want to have a, basically a text overlaid on top of the screen rather than a text bordered. And then we add it to the window for both of those. And then when they get asked to be rendered, we get this out of it. So there's the hack font we downloaded with that bordered font, so the bilayer font. Um, the only thing we have to do in the app is add the hack.ttf, add hackoutline.ttf, and then you can use the exact same string and settings for everything for both layers. And uh, the source is available for this if anyone's interested. Um, next, we're going to talk about another technique of making it so your, te your text can stay legible without having to do this bordered font. The bordered font doesn't work really well with very thin characters, like an LCD font or uh, very uh, scripty ones, like, like the hand-drawn uh, fonts people have. Um, so this is a trick called scrims. Um, someone pointed out yesterday that that's just a fancy name for dark overlays that have been out forever. Uh, lately, Android's been pushing this as a UI feature whenever you have a menu pop up or anything else. They want to dim the background to bring out that foreground so you have a better contrast. So you're brought to this content. But you can still see what was behind it. Like, you know, if this is saying, do you want to send your email? You can still see what that email was. You can still see what the other data was. Um, it does a great job of improving the visibility of the content that you care about by just uh, increasing the contrast between that and other content. So in our case, that content that we care about is the date and time. That other content that we still want to see but is less important is this background image. Um, so in this case, I've got this very light scrim. Um, that I'm rendering behind the date and time. So I have it zoomed up there so you guys can actually see that darkness. It's, it's very minute, but if you look over here, it actually does bring the text out. Even when you have a cyan text on blue, rather than the two apparently blending together, you can actually differentiate that text. Um, the way that scrims work is most of the Pebble APIs don't allow transparency. When we do like line drawings with anti-aliasing, we blend right then to the background but we don't give you the option of saying, I want this line to be 50% transparent. I want this rectangle to be 50% transparent. The only option we have for that right now is using gbitmaps. So you can load a resource that's already been uh, pre-modified to being 0%, 30%, 70%, or 100% transparent. And uh, so in this case, we are going to use a 2 by 2 mask pattern that's going to be pseudo-transparent for this. Um, for the watch face I actually have in the App Store, I did it where it was 30% for one pixel and 70% for the other. It made kind of a screen door mesh, and I really like that effect. Um, this one's just a, a very basic scrim. Um, so here's that two by two matrix I used in my app. So this would be the 70%, that would be the 30% transparency. Um, the uh, presentation software just makes everything zero 100%. So here, we create that mask with our resource. And uh, one of the nice things is that Pebble tiles your bitmaps. So rather than having to know how big that box was and making images ahead of time to fit that, so if my text box was um, 60 wide and 40 tall, I don't have to pre-generate a 60 wide, 40 tall bitmap. I can basically just create a smaller one. And when I do graphics draw bitmap in Rect, it will tile it for me to fill the space. So this is nice where I could actually have just a one pixel uh, mask 
of every different transparency and then tile it to get different levels of transparency, different shades of background colors or hues. So basically, if you wanted to tint your entire screen red for some reason, like um, you have a notification, a weather update, you could tint the entire screen by just having a red color with a 30% transparency single pixel. So the cost to your resources is a couple bytes. Um, yeah, so here we see that we basically set up that mask, we drew that, and then on top of that we draw the text. Am I going too fast, or is this an okay speed for everyone? Great. Um, so we're going to move on from fonts, which we're all familiar with. We're going to start digging a little bit more into newer features of the Pebble that we introduced with 3.0. Um, so here we're going to talk about still images. In the past, we had PBI, the Pebble uh, bitmap image, or binary image. And that was a raw, uncompressed bitmap format that was kind of proprietary to Pebble. We had a funny little header at the top, and we had just all the bytes after that. And uh, one of the issues we had was that every byte is actually the opposite order of a normal bitmap byte. So you couldn't even just take a bitmap and switch the headers. You actually had to do all the swapping yourself. Um, one of the great things is when we did 3.0, we decided we really need a real image format. We're going to go with PNG because everyone knows PNG. It's a great format. One of the reasons it's so great is um, it has between 1 and 256 colors for this PNG 8 format. The 8 in PNG 8 means it's uh, up to 8 bits. So uh, when you go beyond PNG 8, then you have true color, where you'd actually have like a RG, you have the full color values for everything. Um, for this one, it's going to actually store a table of colors, a palette. And then in the actual image data, it just stores that value. So if I have two colors, black and white, in the image, it'll store 0 or 1. In the palette, it'll say 0 was black, 1 was white. Uh, it doesn't seem too uh, valuable when you're talking about just black and white. But when you start talking about, well, I have a red that's 30% transparent, and a red that's 70% transparent, and a white that's fully opaque, um, these palettes become very valuable to us. Where we, um, PNG also does um, optimal uh, transparency savings. It only stores the alpha channel if a color actually uses it. So if you only have one color that has a transparency, it only stores one transparent value for that color. So if I have 64 colors and one's transparent, it costs me that one byte overhead. If all 64 colors are, all 64 of them have um, transparency entries. Um, one of the problems is that now that we've got 64 colors, going from our one bit format to this new eight bit format, we should be going from 3K to 24K of I image size. And uh, that really eats into our RAM, and it also eats into our resources. Uh, so one of the great things with this is that for our resources, it actually gets filtered and compressed with deflate, um, which a lot of us just call zip. Um, and uh, basically, that saves us on the resource side. And then uh, PNG8 allows 1, 2, 4, and 8-bit color depths. And uh, basically, if you're using the 1-bit color depth, <laughs> black, white, red, blue, orange, green, just two colors, you're going to save up to eight times the memory. If you're using four colors, you're going to save four times the memory. 16 colors, you're going to save half the memory. And if you're using all the colors, it's going to take you that full 24K memory. Um, so this is really great for us in that we could have more images on the system. And very typically, most of your background images or icons are low color. So they might have two colors, four colors. So we're going to get a, a really good uh, memory savings out of this. Um, one of the other great things about PNG, which I mentioned earlier, was this transparency. A lot of people asked us, well, because later on we talk about doing animations, like animated PNGs, why didn't we just use GIF for images and just use GIF for animations? And uh, one of the issues is that GIF doesn't have real transparencies. They have a fake or pseudo transparency where they say, well, you're not using the color pink, so I'm going to mark pink as transparent. So anywhere in the image that I, I draw pink, it becomes transparent. Where PNG has this real transparency. So you can see here, I can blend. I can have a background image, have a half transparent image, and then another one on top of that, and they all blend together. Whereas GIF, you just have a hole, and you just have the shapes. Um, one of the hard things about these images is creating them. So a lot of people have used Photoshop or GIMP or any of these other, uh, other image editors. Um, but a lot of times, once you get past like, doing one or two images, you want to just really script it. You want to have some tools on the side that you can just point at a folder, make quick changes, and see how it turns out. 
uh, for me, I actually have a script that tries eight different variants. And then I look in the folder to see which one I like the best. So basically, one of them will do high, high contrast. One of them will do um, a dither pattern. Another one of them will just do the 64 colors directly. And I can kind of pick out which image is going to look best on the Pebble and just generate all that from a script rather than doing it all in Photoshop each time. Um, Image Magic is great and that it's free and open source. It's just a very simple command line app. It's available for Linux, uh, Mac, and Windows. You can just brew install it on Mac. Um, the basic features that we talk about for Pebble would be like scaling and cropping. It can add text to an image. It can add borders. It can even add complex shapes. So I can put like a, a, a circular border on an image. I can do a spiral. I can do a lightning bolt. It has all these uh, drawing routines in Image Magic to just script it on top of your image. Uh, it can convert pretty much any image format out there to PNG 8. And then it even has built in color reduction in Divid Ream. Uh, one of the interesting things about Image Magic is they don't officially support palettes, but they su support GIFs. So, as a, a workaround that they provided a long time ago, they said, well, GIFs are guaranteed to have a palette. So, they have an option to basically say, I want to have a, a color table. You point it at uh, a GIF, and you can use that as your color palette. And so in uh, some of our tutorials online, we actually show you how you can convert images, point it at uh, a GIF table so you can get these dithered images to be the, the pebble colors. Um, so here's kind of a fun one. Uh, last year, I talked about the XKCD comic app I had made, where it was a black and white Creative Commons comic for pebble. And it was great at the time in that we had uh, a black and white screen. XKCD was all line art, so it fit on the pebble display really well. And uh, it was just the black and white, so I, everything worked really well. Um, one of the issues with that app was, if, if any of you have read XKCD, he has no rules about his formatting. Some frames will be huge with small pictures in them. Some of them will be gigantic, you know, 400 megapixels that you can scale around. Um, sometimes he has a frame within a frame, multiple frames, all these different sh uh, shapes and sizes. It makes it very hard to script. Um, I found this great Creative Commons comic called Mimi and Eunice. Um, she's the mascot for the EFF, and uh, there's 500 of them. And uh, the lady who created them always does the three-panel format. They're always in the same spot. It's pretty much perfect for scripting. So I took this comic on the left, um, where I had chopped it off from the, the track pictures, and I tried two different ways of making it to a circle. So on the left there, you see um, I basically used image magic to say, from the center, I want to extend this image to become 180 by 180. And uh, what it's going to do is, if that image has a background color set, it's going to fill the rest of that color up to 180 by 180 with that color. So luckily, all these images had that blue, so it becomes this. And then I say, um, now that it's this big 180 by 180 rectangle, I want to take my image, draw a circle, 90-90 uh, radius, and then I want to draw everything outside of 90 as a transparent, and that's literally going to just crop it. And then uh, the second case is, um, so that first one's nice, that you can customize it for different sizes of circles. This is great if you want to have like a, a small uh, weather icon or a small uh, smiley face in the middle of your screen that's a circle. Um, you can make them whatever configurable size you want. Um, if you want to make your image exactly fit the pebble display, so you don't waste any extra pixels that are off the screen, you want to make sure it just it's the, the best compression you're going to get out of it. Uh, you can use a second example where we're actually taking the hardware mask for the pebble and we're uh, compositing it on top of our image and it's going to set the alpha to ours, which means that everywhere this has an alpha, it's going to wipe our color and become fully transparent. So in the end, that image matches our uh, screen shape exactly. Um, our screen's almost a perfect circle, but obviously anytime you do um, hardware, it's um, basically a little bit of pixel rounding. Um, so here's the final example of the Mimi comic viewer with these circular images. I'm sliding them in. Um, I just call them coins. I like that uh, effect where it just slides up if it's a new comic. It slides left if it's a continuation. It's really fun to play with a circular space in that, like, how would you read a comic strip on a circle watch? Would you just slide the entire square panels? That wouldn't really make sense. Um, so I thought this would be great. It saves a lot of space in that each image is only the minimal size that's going to be displayed. Um, there's that black border on them, so you can see them sliding over the top of each other. And uh, the great thing is each of these comics has a different bold background. 
Um, so it gives this really nice uh, liveliness between one frame to the next. Um, so there we just talked a lot about PNG. And a lot of us know about PNG. We know how to make them. We know how to convert them. Um, we're going to talk about something that's a little bit newer um, tooling-wise. We're going to talk about SVGs for Pebble, or the Pebble Draw Command format. Um, one of our engineers worked rather hard so that we could have vector graphics on Pebble. Um, if, when you're looking at the watch, these are the moving star. These are the icons that pop out from the middle of the screen. Um, because they're vector graphics, we can even do things as, as advanced as having one icon morph into another icon. Or have one icon, rather than slide from one spot to another, we can take the points and kind of move them one at a time so the entire animation spiders across the screen. Um, this is all done because we actually have access to those, um, the elements themselves, so we can just move them, like iterate over them and move them. And uh, all these APIs are provided in the current S uh, Pebble SDK, so you can do all the same effects that you see on the Pebble screen. Um, some of the more basic ones that everyone has seen is you can scale a vector, obviously. Uh, you can move it around on, on the screen with translation, so you can put it within the box and just shimmy all the points. Um, you can walk through all the points and change the colors. So, so I can say everywhere I had red, I want to make it blue. So you can change the entire um, vector color. And you can even stretch it where you can take those points and kind of you know, make it look like it's kind of uh, jello, just stretching from one side to the other. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how you make those SVGs. Uh, one of the issues we have right now is that our conversion tool was um, a little bit rushed and done for a specific purpose. We wanted to be able to use it with Illustrator for our designers to make the original Pebble time um, that most of you already have. Um, so we had a very specific use case. One of the hard things with uh, SVG is the format is really rubbish. It has so many different ways to do the same thing, and the rules are so unbound that no two tools make the same SVG. If you open something in uh, Illustrator, in Inkscape, in uh, Krita, any of these other tools, every SVG looks different. And when you open it in a different SVG editor, more than likely it won't look the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through two tools. Um, Inkscape, which is an open source vector graphics uh, tool. I like it because it runs on Linux. Uh, and then we'll also uh, talk about Illustrator for people who are Mac and do more uh, uh, professional graphics. But like I said, sit here. Being free doesn't make it easy. Inkscape is pretty rough around the edges, too. Um, so actually, if you guys wanted to, you could uh, follow, uh, follow up with this. Um, any of you have Inkscape installed or Illustrator? Um, we're going to download a vector graphic from Pixabay. Um, Pixabay is one of my favorite resources. All the images on here are sorted as uh, JPEGs, PNGs, and vector graphics. And they're all Creative Commons. They're all uh, CC0, which means that the images are public domain. You can use them however you want. You can use them in your demos, in your apps. And uh, they have just a ton of great art. Um, so here I searched for robots. I found this great vector graphic of some robots. And I wanted to use this for a watch face. So I'm going to open that um, robot in Inkscape. Um, does anyone need a second to download an image and open it? or? Nope, OK. Um, but I don't really want all two, four, six robots on the public screen. I actually want to have just one at a time. And uh, I was looking through these, and I kind of like this guy with the, the bendy straw arms. So why don't we select those guys on the left? We just highlight over them, control X them, and make them go away. And uh, let's get rid of that little Roomba on the right. And uh, did the same thing, selected him, made him go away. So now we've just got the one image. But the problem is, if you look at our canvas at our page, it's rather huge, and our image is way off to the right. If we were to render this on Pebble, this guy would be off the screen, because Pebble would be trying to draw that white space over there. So what we're going to do is, under um, File Document Properties, we're going to open up the um, properties for the, the page itself for the format. And there's this great button, Resize Page to Draw in or Selection. It's just kind of an auto fix. We click on it. And our image fits. But at the same time, this is telling us earlier our image um, was 363 tall for this height. We're going to use that uh, knowledge in just a second. So now we want to actually scale that image to fit Pebble. Uh, it is a vector graphic. We can later on go through and scale it at runtime. 
But why don't we just start with it at the right size, so then we don't have to do anything just to put it on the screen. So I'm going to say that original 363, oh, I'd like half of that. So I'm going to scale it proportionally by 50-50. And now that we've scaled it, we're back to the same problem that our image doesn't fill the full page again. So we're going to go back to file document properties and do the resize page to fit drawing so that our image is perfectly centered in that space. Um, so now we're going to get into a little bit of the workarounds we have to do for our current converter. Um, we're, we're hoping to eventually improve this tool or have someone in the community um, improve it for their own uses. But for the, in the meantime, this is the, we basically have to make it into a tiny SVG, a flat SVG. So we go under object uh, properties and we're going to ungroup everything. So we've selected the image and we're saying, take all these individual pieces and ungroup them. Nothing's relative to each other. Um, one of the problems with SVG is you can have super nested groups. So I can say, well, all I have on the screen is lines. But half of them are uh, stroke two, half are stroke one. I'm going to make two groups. And the first group, half of them are red, half of them are blue. I'm going to make that another group. And then of those, half of those are dashed and half of those aren't. And also, I'm four groups nested down. Um, our tooling right now only supports one depth of groups. And uh, one of the nice things is that uh, Illustrator, when you export, only exports one depth of groups. Um, to get around that in Inkscape right now, we just ungroup. Or if, if you know you've only got one depth of groups, you're fine. So now, um, if we were to try out this image right now, it might be just fine. Or it might seem like a couple things are shifted around. Um, they have some matrix operations that say, like, this is rotated, moved over here. Uh, to get rid of that, we're going to go to Object Transform. And we're going to disable that relative move and apply it to each object separately. So the objects will have hard-coded positions for where they're on the screen. Originally, it could have been I had the entire arm. And it says that this finger was relative to the arm this far over. And we're going to just remove all those relative moves so everything is just a flat position. Uh, then we're going to click uh, File Save. And uh, we can save in Optimize SVG. And a lot of times, this will make a much more compressed image. But I found uh, Inkscape's export for Optimize SVG usually breaks the image, and you can't re-import it to SVG. Um, plain SVG works just fine, too. And for me, it was a very small difference between the two for size. Um, so now, if any of you were doing that, we can uh, get clone these two repositories. That's going to give us the tools to convert this image to Pebble and the example code. Um, we're going to run this uh, command that's in the PDC image under the, sorry, under the cards example, we have tools. Um, the SVG to PDC.py, that's our converter that we've provided to the community that'll take the SVG, run through all the, the different paths, and convert it over to a, a pebble draw command format. Anyone need a second on this? Nope, OK. Um, we can copy that uh, test PDC we generated here into the uh, PDC image example resources commands, build it, and install it. And this is what we get on the right. So this is our original vector graphic on the left, a pretty advanced one with some nice um, you know, uh, curves, uh, viziers, his cool arms. And the majority of that was preserved on here. Um, this is us basically just opening an image, converting it over, and saving it. We didn't do anything with line widths. We didn't do anything to fix it for Pebble. We just basically converted it as is and saw how it worked. If we were to take this back, I'd probably make these lines on his arms thicker so when we convert them, they don't kind of fade out. Or I might make his, um, his eyes a little bit bigger so the circles, when they get converted into uh, pebble circles, have a little bit more width to them. Uh, let's do the same thing with Illustrator now. And I like it. I have their tiny, tiny, tiny SVG. One of the great things is that Illustrator natively uh, supports this ungrouped minimal format. Uh, for SVG. In Inkscape, we had to kind of fake it by changing a couple options here and there. So we're going to go back to Pixabay, and we're going to grab another cool ve vector graphic. And we're going to open it in Illustrator. And then, is anyone following along with the Illustrator one in Illustrator? Or just watching? Okay. Just want to make sure I wasn't going too fast for this. Um, first, we're going to scale the image to fit the screen. 
Um, when we opened the image, we saw that it was pretty large. We're going to make it 25% of that. And we get this uh, smaller image. And uh, for this image and a couple others, I found that um, even though you don't always have to, it's safest to always ungroup. Um, you probably don't want to when you first run through it, like your image might just turn out. To make sure it always turns out, if you ungroup, it'll always work. Um, we're going to go to Object, Artboards, Fit to Selected Art. That's going to take our page canvas again and fit it right to the image. Um, we're going to click on File, Save As. And then up here, we have these SVG profiles. And this is the great thing that we wanted from Illustrator at the top, SVG Tiny 1.1. One, one. That's going to kind of guarantee that we have a very small subset of PNG we're, we're coding to. Um, a lot of older Symbian devices and uh, Nokia phones only supported SVG Tiny. And uh, one of the other great things is that on um, this file save as window, we have that little button on the bottom left, SVG code. If we click on that, it's going to open up the vector graphic XML. Um, SVGs are just stored in a plain text XML format. And uh, so now we can look through this. And uh, it's pretty obvious with the um, SVGs coming out of Inkscape or Illustrator that if they're just a bunch of lines with paths on the left, you're fine. If it looks like there's a whole lot of garbage and weird transforms and RTF and binary images in there, then you know that you have to go and change something about your image. Um, so here we're going to do that same SVG to PC conversion we did for Inkscape. So clone those two repositories, use the tool to convert the image, copy in the folder, build and build and install. And uh, so there's our original uh, vector graphic. And here's how it looks on the Pebble from Illustrator. So and these are both um, real screenshots I took from my watch after I installed it. So that's how it actually renders on the watch. Which isn't too bad, considering, like I mentioned earlier, we didn't do anything for the line width of these half pixel whites or the little um, gradient in the circle. We didn't really optimize the image to look good on Pebble. We just converted it over as a first shot. And it ended up, ends up looking pretty decent. We might want to go through and retool that, maybe get rid of some of the curvature. Um, so, so far, we've talked about fonts. We've talked about a couple image formats, SVG, PNG. Um, but these are all static. These are all things that are just kind of fixed on the screen. Let's actually talk about making the watch a little bit more lively, a little, little bit more fun. Um, basically, like, if time is always moving, why isn't your watch face? Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is APNG, animated PNG. Um, one of the great things is when we decided to um, add PNG to the Pebble, we looked at, well, we'd also like to add some support for an animated format. Uh, maybe like GIF or something to that effect. It ends up that the difference between PNG and animated PNG is about 30 lines of code for us. So it's a pretty small cost for a pretty big feature. Um, one of the uh, great things about a APNG is it was created by Mozilla as an alternative to GIF. It uh, has those real transparencies we like. Uh, back then, GIF was patent encumbered. So a lot of people didn't want to ship GIF because you might have to pay royalty. You might get sued. Um, Recently, Apple jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, APNGs are pretty cool. And they added native support to it the week after we landed it in the firmware, which is really cool. I was convincing everyone that this APNG thing was a cool thing. We finally met, landed it. And then next week, a Apple was like, hey, APNG is a cool thing. So it's kind of an awesome validation for us. Um, we get all the compression and memory benefits of PNG. And uh, with APNG, it does uh, differential frames. So if I have um, a full screen image to start with and the, a smiley face just blinks his eyes and that's the only thing that changes, from frame to frame, I only have to save the little portions of his eyes that blink, not the entire change of image. So each additional frame is only the change in content. More like H.264, any of those, where you just save these uh, B frames, these different frames. Some of the cons of APNG is they're very hard to generate. You can't generate them in Inkscape, in Photoshop. You can't generate them with pretty much any GUI-based tool. Um, GIMP does have a plugin to add APNG, but it's not natively, natively built in. So what this usually entails is that we have to export a GIF or a PNG sequence from whatever tools we're using. Uh, PNG se sequences are great in that it'll be all of your individual frames, 
And a lot of times there'll also be a timing file, like a file that says how long that, that last frame's duration is. And then uh, APNG assembler, and uh, I think there's APNG bake, will both take those APNG sequences and recreate uh, APNG out of it. So you can export from Photoshop uh, PNG sequences and convert them right to APNG. Um, and then another one of the cons is that most tools support GIFs. So sometimes the easiest path is um, if there's not a feature that GIF doesn't support, like if I'm not really using real transparency, if I'm just using the pseudo transparency, and I just want to quick export an animation, I can just export it as a GIF and convert it using GIF to APNG. So that's what we're doing here. This tool is called Pebble GIF. Um, I threw it together because I wanted to make some fun animated watches, but I didn't, want, well, I didn't want to spend a lot of time in Photoshop, you know, creating layers, modifying all these things. I just wanted to take a GIF from the web, you know, Mario 64's cool head, and just convert that GIF to an APNG. And uh, so I created this uh, fun little tool down here, Pebble GIF, and it basically is a modified W script for WAF, which is our build engine. So when I say Pebble clean and Pebble build, It'll look in this GIF folder to see if there's any GIFs. It'll run it through GIFsicle, which is a GIF optimizer. What GIFsicle is going to do is it's going to say, well, if the image is bigger than 144 by 144, I'm going to scale it down using a good scaling algorithm. I'm going to convert it to Pebbles palette and dither it if I'm missing colors. And uh, we're basically going to get an optimized GIF before we convert it to an APNG. We're going to use GIF to APNG, which will take that GIF and just convert right over to an MA PNG. We won't get any of the uh, special transparencies added back in. We've already lost those. But um, if that wasn't the issue for us, then we're, we're fine with this. Um, we do have an issue that our GIF to APNG is a modified version. Um, you can't just grab the one from SourceForge. You actually have to use ours. The reason for that is um, we do a memory savings feature in GIF to APNG that the default tool doesn't do. So when we convert over the image, we actually make it more memory efficient for us. And uh, basically, Sherry is going to, at 2 o'clock today, talk about um, modifying the WAF scripts to do some of these kind of tricks for yourself. So if you want to auto-generate some kind of resource like the SVGs, if you want to automatically pull down the latest uh, quotes from some character from the web at build time and rebake it for, with current data, um, you can add that to your WAF. And that's pretty much all we're doing here is that um, actually, for one of our uh, recent hack nights at Pebble, we invited a bunch of non-programmers to a little uh, tutorial session. And uh, we call it Hack Night. And uh, basically, we gave all of them Pebble GIF. We helped give them all set up. And all of these people were non-programmers. They were marketing, sales, 14-year-old, uh, um, couple in interns um, for art and design. Um, and we gave them all Pebble GIF. And people just found their favorite GIFs on the web or created their own, dropped in a folder, and made watch faces out of them. Um, the impressive thing for me was a lot of people were trying to figure out, like, how do I use this command line thing to build? You know, how do I do this install to Pebble? How do I pair my watch with my phone and the computer? The 14-year-old in the corner was just blowing past everyone, made the coolest animated zombie Nyan Cat watch face with zombie fonts. And it looked awesome. And he basically had it when you flicked, it would change between two different zombie modes. Um, you know, just shows youth. Um, <laughs> and uh, so this modified gift to APNG, we provide it on uh, Pebble Hacks, and I've also added the source directly to this Pebble GIF. Um, so if you want to rebuild it for yourself or see the source code modification, it is included here. Um, so here's a couple examples of Pebble GIF watch faces I've made. Um, one of the fun things, we're actually in talks with the creator of Nyancat to make an official Nyancat watch face for Pebble. And uh, we're in talks with him for a while and talking about uh, creating an uh, app, getting some assets from him, putting a coder on it. And then at the last moment, we decided for uh, marketing purposes, we just wanted to throw together something to show on the watch. So I took the Nyancat GIF from his website, threw it in Pebble GIF, and made that. And when he saw that, he's like, oh, so we're done. This is great. And we're like, no, no, this is an auto-generated watch face. He's like, it's animated. It looks nice. It's got the date and time. Like, what more would we do? And uh, so it's kind of fun where this Pebble GIF tool um, ends up making you know, good enough results. And you can see down here, these two on the right. Um, I had Pebble GIF working on Tintin, where it actually built the APNG into the app itself. So you can see these two dithered uh, black, white, and that fake gray watch faces from the old Tintin days. And uh, kind of like the Mario watch face, it's also fun to render 3D objects. 
and then uh, make them to APNGs. So up there I have a little Creative Commons uh, paper craft world that um, I spent like a couple hours in Blender figuring out how to just rotate and make an like record the animation because Blender is also another fun open source tool that's hard to use and uh, recorded that and then just made this watch face out of it. So it looks like it's an actual 3D rendering even though it's just pre-rendered. Um, so now we're getting to the, the part of the presentation where we're going to talk about the most advanced things. So we started early on with fonts, pretty easy. Moved on to uh, PNG and SVG images. You know, a little bit newer to some of us, and uh, now we're going to kind of dive off the deep end and talk about frame buffers and bit effects. Um, one of the great things was, I think it was about a year, year and a half ago, uh, I think right before the last Pebble developer retreat, we added the frame buffer API to Pebble. And uh, before that point, you could load a, a bitmap um, from a resource or from the web, but once it was loaded, you couldn't touch it. You could only use it. You could just draw it. And the same thing with app frame buffer. You could use our drawing commands to draw on the screen, but once, um, other than our APIs, you could not touch the screen directly. So if you had some really fast optimized line drawing, or if you had your own Bezier curves, or any of those kind of things, you couldn't use them. And uh, when we added the frame buffer API, this basically opens up the door for you to do anything you want. You can grab bit data and individually change pixels. You can read the value and increment it so you can make everything brighter and darker. You have full access to do anything you can imagine. So what I have here is um, these particle effects for fireworks. And what it's doing is I've grabbed, I've, I've created an um, off-screen bitmap. I've used the frame buffer API, API to grab those, um, that data directly. And I wrote a very simple draw pixel algorithm that instead of drawing one pixel actually draws four directly in the data. So this is actually like an array. I have to do the you know, y times stride plus x gets me to this spot and actually draw that pixel. And uh, that allows me to draw these pixels directly on there. Um, because it's a frame buffer, it doesn't get wiped between uh, window redraws. So the content persists. It, it composites. It, it, um, in OpenGL, this would be called an accumulation buffer, where I can do an effect that accumulates over time. Um, so the other thing is because it's the uh, frame buffer and I can actually read those values and I'm not actually blending it, it's actually drawn as the background image, um, that fade effect you see where the fireworks explode and they kind of fizzle out over time, I don't really know where the fireworks are at, at any time other than the current frame. So anything I've previously drawn, previously accumulated, to me is just stuff on the screen. So what I do is because I'm not making it transparent, I take those two bits of transparency I said, well, you know what? That would make a really good countdown. I'll set them to three. And after five frames, I'll set it to two. After five more frames, I'll set it to one. Then I'll start lo slowly lowering the color shade by shade. So I use it as a countdown timer. So when a new firework explodes, like in the real world, it stays up there for a little bit, and it slowly fades away. And uh, this is something great that we can only do because we have a frame buffer. Um, one of the issues with that, like I was just saying, I had to write my own. Uh, frame buffer drawing function. I had to tell it like how to actually read and write on the screen. And on the new uh, circular APIs, we, we've given you a couple um, convenience functions that you have to use to get the correct position on the circular frame buffer. Um, so if I wanted to get, you know, 170 down on the screen, it used to be I could just do 170 times stride plus my x. Well, now that's not true. I have to know how big every single row was to get to this point. We have the um, gbitmap data uh, get row info. And I say, I want row 170 here. And I'll say, oh, that row's offset in memory is this address. It's min and max, so you can do your own clipping. It's from here to here. So it's a super convenient function. It means I don't have to do my own mathematics. I don't have to do my own clipping to make sure I'm on the screen. I can just read that value, go to that loc location, and just start drawing. Um, but once again, the problem with frame buffer was I, I still had to create my own pixel drawing algorithms. Um, so if I want to do anti-aliasing, I have to write it myself. If I want to do a Bezier curve, you have to write it yourself. If I want to draw a uh, font, any of that kind of stuff to this uh, side buffer, I would have to write all that code myself. Well, I didn't really want to do that. So what I did is um, came up with a concept of off-screen rendering. What this is, is it's kind of a twist on uh, the frame buffer axis except for now we're going to actually link our graphics context 
that we have to use for drawing with the Pebble APIs. And we're going to link it to that off-screen buffer. What this essentially means now is I can do that accumulation. I can do all those tricks. I can have that direct access to that content. But rather than re-implementing the wheel and making my own draw line, draw pixel, draw font, uh, draw vizier curve, draw circle, draw arc, draw radial, I can just use the Pebble ones. I can accumulate off to the side, so I've got this nice anti-laced line in this case. And uh, because I own that frame buffer, not only can I accumulate to it, but I can do transparency effects. I can uh, gbitmap rotate it, so I can rotate text. I can flip it. I can make it melt. I have full access to everything after it's been rendered. Um, it doesn't have to be the full size of the screen. With the off-screen rendering, you can make the off-screen buffer any size you want. So you can make it just as big as your text. You can make it the full size of the screen. Um, it really depends on what you want to do with that. But once again, this is um, a great benefit to us because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We use Pebble APIs to render off screen, and then we have full access to manipulate them however we want to after the fact, or just accumulate them. Um, so here's a cool use of that um, trick or technology. Um, now that we've got off screen rendering, one of the features we don't have in the Pebble SDK right now is you cannot draw transparent text. When we draw text, you set the color, but the color does not respect opacity. So you can say it's blue, it's red, it's green, but it'll always be fully opaque text. Um, so now that we can render it off screen, um, now that we can render it off screen, we're going to create small bitmaps as big as the text. We're going to draw the font using the graphics draw text to that bitmap. And then we're going to run over it and make it um, semi-transparent with a direct frame buffer axis. So I'll just go through every pixel and say anything that was uh, opaque, I'm going to make it 50% 50, 50 transparent. And we get overlays. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, where we can do like some hues. We can do, um, I want to keep my analog watch. But the problem with analog watches is if you have that digital time behind them, the hands are always covering your digital time. This gets rid of that issue in that I can always see my watch hands. I can always see my background image. But now the text is just an overlay. This might be kind of fun if you want to flick and have the digital time pop up or some other trick to keep your analog and your overlay separate. And uh, so the source code on how to use um, off-screen rendering is here. Um, I think we already had someone that found a good use for it yesterday uh, for rotating text on Pebble. So that was awesome. Um, so here's the code of how we accomplish that. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we get our graphics context for a layer. We're going to capture the frame buffer from the graphics context. So essentially getting the, the thing we want to draw to on the screen usually. We're going to back up all of its data, its memory address, its format, its stride. We're going to create the off-screen bitmap we want to render to, so in this case 80 by 32. We're going to re-pivot the graphics context that would normally render on our screen to render on to this off-screen bitmap. We're going to draw the words hello. We're going to use a little user-provided library run over all those pixels and just make anything that was opaque transparent. We're going to restore the original um, frame buffer so we can draw elsewhere on the screen. And then we're going to graphics draw rotated text. And now that our text is in a bitmap, we can rotate the text. So it'll be transparent rotated text. And at the end, we just destroy that off-screen bitmap when we're, we're done using it. Um, so that was kind of a fun example of like, we've got animations, we've got these cool effects. Well. With animations, we start consuming more power. And uh, so with great power usage comes great responsibility. So in the past, a lot of people have done flick to animate. Uh, so this is the case with the Cat watch face and a lot of other people's apps, where when you want to start that animation, you flick your wrist. It's nice because it triggers that backlight and also triggers the animation. Um, it's very power conservative in that it's only um, used when you flick your wrist. It's only on demand. Um, but at the same time, it's only when you demanded it. So when I look down at my watch, I don't have the animation unless I forcefully trigger it. Um, as an alternative, I threw together a little example called glancing. Um, it's more like gestures. When you bring up your wrist, it'll start the animation. When you rotate your wrist, it'll start the animation. It doesn't require this hard flick. So it's basically when you look at your watch, it'll animate. Um, right now, this is just a third-party library. I use it for my apps. Um, so it's not something that's it's not baked into the SDK. It's not an official feature. It's just a way of accomplishing an alternative to the tap service. Um, this gives us basically, if the watch is active, 
we can still do a timeout. I could say after five or 10 seconds, I still want the animation to timeout. And then I could tell when it's inactive, when the person's dropped the wrist. And before the next animation is triggered, you must be inactive, so the watch would have to start from rest and be brought up, or it would have to be rotated out and back in. And uh, you can configure it to control the backlight or not. And that's it. So any questions? Why do some pops break when you go over generally like size 50 or 60? That I don't know off the top of my head, Brad. <laughs> um, the reason is that we store the data in a byte and actually it's, um, we store the total amount of bytes um, and if you do the diagonal math, we actually exceed the amount of potential pixels in the glyphs. It's the, underlying, the underlying format uses yeah. a, a, a size, those size value using a bit width that can only represent up to so many bits in your font bitmap. Oh, okay. So it's... Is there any workaround? Yes. Render, render off screen into bitmaps and include your bitmaps in your drawing interface. You can scale them. But then you cannot leverage anything of our drawing uh, text flow or anything. Right. In general, I have many concerns with our text uh, format. I mean, um, people on that Slack right now discuss this. Um, you cannot vertically send anything because we don't know where the baseline of the text is, nor do we know how tall the actual text is. So a typographer would call that caps. We don't know anything about the designers at the bottom. So all we really know is how tall is the total line. If you draw 10 lines, what it is that um, the tenth of that, that text block, basically. So that includes white space in between the lines and all the measurements I gave before. As a, as a UI layout, uh, you have no control over anything, and you're basically already into pixel notch. Um, we hopefully change that in the future. Plus one. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Any other questions about fonts, off-screen rendering, Pebble APIs? You, your, your cloud thing, um, library. Have you done any sort of stats on how nope. effective that is in terms of power? Uh, so we looked a little bit about uh, power usage. Um, it only uses the accelerometer because it's on the, the user app side. It doesn't have any access to like low-level firmware control. Um, so it's the same as running like a bath, uh, background health app like Misfit or Jawbone or any of those. It consumes the same amount of power actively. Um, I've been kind of tweaking out for my own usage where I have a, the Fireworks app and a couple others in the app store, like the Mario watch face I'm going to upload that um, I like how it it's used. I still get a pretty good battery life out of it, about the same as if I had a fitness tracker running on the watch. Okay. If you use glancing for backlight, then you get significantly degraded battery life today. Right. Did, did it then, like, just trigger occasionally and what are you going to do? Yeah, the, the check to backlight is much more battery efficient today. It will right. be less uh, if you're doing something like toggling um, a second hand or you're trying to, you're toning down basically the amount of animations when glancing is not enabled, so then it, depending on how much you do, it ends up being a wash. Right. Cool. All right, well, thank you.